All right. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Talking Ball Live with Pat Leonard. April is here. The NFL Draft Month upon us. I always chuckle when friends and family and people in other industries ask me, what do you do in the offseason, in the NFL offseason? What do you do? I just laugh to myself. This is a perfect example of what covering the NFL is like. You know, at a nice family time during the quick Easter break here, you jump into the month of April, you walk into Monday, April 1st, and the NFL news cycle, as busy as ever, um, phone calls all day today, just constant draft talk, uh, sharing information with people around the league about teams' plans, um, you know, how you feel rosters are shaping up, what teams' needs still are, where they might go. A lot of what I want to talk about with you guys today is these scenarios of trades up, trades down, uh, the Giants quarterback decision in that market. I know we've talked a lot about that already on our live Q&As here, but I love hearing what the Giants fans feel about how their franchise is moving and operating. And then I always feel like I can provide a good perspective from my standpoint on where they're moving, where they're training their eyes and their gaze, and where things stand. First, want to tell you guys about Bet Online, and then we'll get right into your questions. The tournament is here. As you see, you know, Caitlin Clark and Iowa battling with uh, Angel Reese and LSU. Bet Online is your bracket headquarters for this season with the best bracket contest out there and odds, lines, and info on every game, every round, right up until the national championship. You can access the most up to the minute wagering information anytime from your desktop or your mobile devices and even track your bracket live in real time all the way through the tournament. Head to the Bet Online app today and the website and get in on the action. Remember to use the promo code BLEAV, B-L-E-A-V, for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online, where the game starts. Remember, you are here with Pat Leonard. I am the NFL columnist and Giants beat writer for the New York Daily News and also host of the Talking Ball with Pat Leonard podcast, on the Believe Network, you are with me here on YouTube at PL on NFL is the channel. Hit that subscribe button. Uh, as you see, Jacob always gives us the reminder. Hit that like and the sub button for Pat on your way in. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, you can purchase a super chat or super sticker to move your comment right to the top of the chat as the candy man has here. That's a great way to support our podcast, support the lives, give back. Um, And also interact, right? Because this queue does fill up with questions and insight from dedicated and diehard Giants fans. And if I'm not getting to it quickly enough, which I will try, but if I'm not, um, that's a good way for me to see yours right away and address it immediately. But even if you're not purchasing a super chatter, super sticker or a super chat, you can just hit that thumbs up, that like button that helps let all the Giants fans out there know on YouTube about this community that we have built, that we are continuing to build, um, and the fun work and the regular live chats we have here. We do two a week during the offseason right now, unless the schedule gets a little bit different at times based on travel. But typically we're doing Mondays and Thursdays, 9 p.m. live Eastern time. Um, And then during the season, we got these started last season during the 2023 year. And I think the post games were a real hit. We did post game live chats right from the stadium, whether it was at MetLife Stadium or on the road when I'm following the Giants around the country. Uh, It was a great way to kind of unload from the locker room and give you guys like really detailed insights about what I was seeing and hearing and who I was talking to after these games and also having the the in-person view of these plays and the full field and the all 22 live, so to speak to give you like a firsthand knowledge of how their wins and losses went down. Um, So we were doing those after the games and that will continue in this 2024 year when we hope more good comes for the giants than bad. But as we see early on early lines, Vegas odds makers have the giants at six and a half wins for the 2024 year. Uh, So that'll be interesting to see if the giants can use this NFL draft to uh, bolster their chances and their fortunes in 2024. Want to get right to Candyman, though. Candyman starts us off again with the $5 Super Chat. Candyman, a dedicated listener and viewer, appreciate that. He says, now that we have Brian Burns in that trade from the Carolina Panthers, could Kayvon Thibodeau be part of a trade with Arizona? 
since we don't have enough draft capital to compete with the Minnesota Vikings. Candy, that's an interesting uh, scenario. I think that for Joe Shane to trade his fifth overall pick in the th- before his third season with the team coming off a double digit sack year. I think that your idea in posing that scenario is a, a smart and reasonable workshopping of how a giant's trade like that could happen. But it'd be, I would be hard pressed to see Joe Shane pulling the plug on Kayvon Thibodeau in that regard, uh, because really in a lot of ways, that draft pick and that first draft for Joe Shane is going to make or break his fortunes in New York. Now, you know, I don't disagree with your premise that Thibodeau could be a player who, while we've seen some flashes and good things, you know, do you sell as close to high as you can when you've already paid the edge rusher premium in Brian Burns? And it's highly unlikely that Kayvon Thibodeau is going to get the kind of deal he would be aiming for coming down the pike after year three expires with already with burns on that uh, be a good problem to have. If you had to pay him big money coming off of this third season, that's for sure. Um, I haven't heard anything like that about the giants feelings on Thibodeau. I will say though, candy man. And I don't know if I said this in our last chat, but I do think an under discussed element of the Brian Burns trade is, you know, now listen, this is another reason not to trade a cave on Thibodeau is, you know, you get Brian Burns not only to help your pass rush and lead your pass rush from that edge, but also to form a deeper, more talented group, right? If you add a good pass rusher who you think can be elite, but then you take away your sack leader from last season, you know, are you creating um, a surplus at that position, at that premium position, or are you coming out even or just slightly above in the long run? Uh, there's a lot of elements to consider there, right? Like as you're bringing up about your investment in certain positions, where you're spending your cap space, you have to spread it out throughout the roster. You have to spend it on offense to improve the Giants offense. Um, But it's hard for me to envision Joe Shane and the Giants pulling the plug on Kayvon Thibodeau in a trade like that. Now, I think an honest evaluation of where Kayvon's game is coming off year two is he needs to show more. He's shown some. He needs to show more. It's not enough. And I think what I was getting to earlier is the under-discussed element of paying Brian Burns that contract is investing in Brian Burns, an indictment of the fact that they don't think Thibodeau is that elite guy. So that's that's a question I'm posing, right? I think that's worth discussing is the idea that are they hedging against the idea that they like some things Kayvon does, but is he not going to elevate to that top level and therefore you go and spend and you overspend for a pass rusher like Brian Burns, right? That is at least a, a, um, it's one, one side, one tangent of that conversation that has to be considered. Right. So candy, man, I, you know, you've asked questions like this before that, um, that generate a conversation that generate a legitimate, um, examination of, of the scenario you're posing. Um, I kind of want to see your whiteboard in the back, you know, cause I, I can definitely imagine you workshop in these and uh, just to be, just to be frank, everybody, like these are the kind of conversations that like, there are a lot of conversations that happen in the NFL that never see the light of day that you would be shocked that, wait, they talked about possibly trading that guy or somebody asked about him and they listened for a little bit before saying no. Right. Like, those are, uh, you know, I'm, again, I'm not, I didn't hear anything like this, but I'm just saying, uh, like, like the cave on thing, I mean, but I'm just saying that more happens and more is talked about than you would imagine along the lines of like big names and considering those things. Candyman, way to start us off. Jacob, thanks again for telling everybody to like and subscribe to the page. And let's get to uh, Glock says, hey, what's up, Pat? You got one in March Madness. Um, hard not to pull for the big fella in NC State. I mean, Connecticut's probably the best team, but uh, I got to pull for NC State, you know, while they're while they're still in it. Uh, Roach also says, how many quarterbacks go in the top 15 do you think? All right, so let's call up the draft board again. 
Um, let's see the teams, the teams that are most likely to take a quarterback possibly most likely are Chicago, Washington, New England, the Giants, uh, the Vikings, the Broncos, and the Raiders, right? So those are the, those are the ones viewed as more likely to take a quarterback or heavy in that quarterback market. So that's seven in the top 15, um, I think it's probably likely, let's say, at this moment. You're asking me at this moment. At this moment, I got Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, J.J. McCarthy, and Bo Nix. Let's say five. I'll put I'll put five in the top 15. That's what I'll do. Um, let's see. Jacob says, hey, Pat, thanks for answering these questions. Let's start this live off. Any chance J.J. McCarthy is QB3 over Drake May? How soon do you think the Giants go D-tackle in the draft? Is a guy like Jonathan Brooks unrealistic for us? So I'll answer your first question first. Um, your first question there was, is there any chance J.J. McCarthy is quarterback three over Drake May? Jacob, the Giants' behavior, and this goes back to Candyman's question too. Why is Candyman even suggesting a trade of a player on the roster as well to compete with the Vikings to trade up? And I wrote this for the New York Daily News in Tuesday's paper. You can pick it up. You can read it online. The Giants are behaving like a team that not only is in the quarterback market in the draft, but one that could trade up to get one. Right? They are spending time and resources, significant time and resources, on these passers. And let's just consider JJ McCarthy for a second. Top 30 visit to the Giants, dinner, visit to the facility, all that. Assistant GM and quarterback coach at the Michigan Pro Day. Private workout on Easter Sunday with the GM, the head coach, this large giant contingent, offensive coordinator Mike Kafka, et cetera. You don't spend that kind of time for a smoke screen. You just don't. Um, now, Jacob, it's possible that the Giants do their work, you know, like the NFL reported that they were planning a workout with Drake May because they did not send their full contingent to North Carolina's pro day because that happened coinciding with Washington's. So they, a bunch of them went to Washington. Some people were at North Carolina, but a bunch of them went to Washington, Michael Penix Jr., Roma Dunze. And uh, then they have something else worked out with Drake May, like a different kind of workout. These are meaningful trips that are more than just doing due diligence. It's not smoke screening. It's the Giants doing hard work on the top quarterbacks. Yes, I think it's possible J.J. McCarthy is QB3 over Drake May. Do I definitely know he is? No, I do not. Do I think it's possible... The Giants would prefer in the end, after all this work on J.J. McCarthy, that they would still prefer a guy like Drake May, whose um, draft stock, right, like get, coming out of last season or going into last season, Caleb Williams and Drake May, right? Like those are the two names everybody was talking about, right? Drake May, of course, um, you know, player of the year in the ACC the year before. Some people can poke some holes in his game. But he's viewed as a guy with some upside. He's got the size. He's got the arm, right? We're still, as Joe Shane said to me and others in that in that small room we were in in um, in Orlando, Florida last week. We're not done our evaluation yet. In fact, he said a lot of the teams, including the teams at the top three, are not done their evaluations yet because they still have to get around these players and these quarterbacks more and do more homework on them. So the Giants could love J.J. McCarthy, but also love Drake May. Or they could like both of those quarterbacks, but recognize they're not going to get up to get them and be extremely comfortable with getting Michael Penix Jr. in a slight trade up in the second round or at 47. Because Michael Penix Jr., as good as he looks in every darn workout and time he throws the ball, has that injury history where it's still, as much as I view him as a first-round talent, there's no question about it, can you justify a first round pick on a guy with his injury history? It's tough, right? But the Giants go to Washington and I know I'm, I'm answering about a hundred questions right now answering this, but you got me going on the JJ versus May. 
you know, they go to Washington, and I know this has been talk, talked about ad nauseum on Giants Twitter, but, you know, it's clearly a possibility that they could go with a Roma Dunze at six, a Michael Penix Jr. at 47, or in a slight trade up type of scenario. Yeah, they could do that. If there's a run on quarterbacks ahead of them, does Marvin Harrison Jr. fall to them? Malik Neighbors, Adunze, right? Joe Alt from Notre Dame, the tackle. Like the Giants could be sitting pretty. That's what that's what Jim Harbaugh was saying too. So at, you know, at five with the Chargers. So, um, but the short answer to your question is, yeah, like they're they they are showing clear heavy interest in both of the quarterbacks you just mentioned. You know, McCarthy, May, they did a lot of work on Penix. Uh, they were at Jaden Daniels' pro day. And remember, this is the funny part. Joe Shane, remember how much work he did last fall on Caleb Williams? How all over USC he was? Like the Giants were tracking towards possibly having the number one or number two overall pick at one point. And, you know, there are, there are people in the league who think that ultimately the Giants at one point, you know, they were geared up, ready to go. Caleb Williams or, you know, slight trade up for Caleb Williams or whatever it is. But like, I just talked to a coach today who said that it's in his opinion, it is a quote slam dunk that the Chicago bears take Caleb Williams at number one. So, you know, the giants could be in a scenario, Jacob, where they are going hard after these quarterbacks in the scouting process. But Shane understands that the harsh reality is they won themselves out of the selection where they would ideally get their man and therefore they end up going in a different direction. So your question was how early do I think the giants go D tackle in the draft? I mean, you know, not, not in round one, obviously, um, you know, they have the 47th overall pick in the second round. Then they have, what is it? 70 in the third, I believe. Um, 107 in the fourth. I mean, you know, you draft elite there or you get you get a guy who, you know, it, it depends on how they view it. I mean, I, I would I would say personally, I think at that 47th overall pick, if you don't take a quarterback in the first round, I'm still I'm still training my eyes on quarterback there. If you take a quarterback in the first, I'm looking at wide receiver there or corner, you know, Um you know, I think a corner at this point, based on how their roster looks, they have a need at D tackle too. But I think that that other corner spot would be a bigger need, unless, of course, like we talked about in our last chat, do they wait and wait and wait and on the veteran value market try to patchwork that other corner spot and beef up the interior of the line and try to control the line of scrimmage with a high second round D tackle? Uh, that's not how I view Joe Shane spending his resources, to be honest um in that top second round so my guess would be the highest would be the third round but you know there's no way to know that for sure depends on how the board falls but certainly as far as premium position goes you know joe shane is very much a guy who um believes in value you saw that with the running back conversation with saquon barkley you see that with him letting two safeties walk out the door two productive safeties and julian love and xavier mckinney walk out the door so Hard to imagine him taking a D tackle um, extremely high, given how he's expended his his resources so far in the NFL draft. Um, but certainly there's been a focus on the defensive line and on the pass rush, um, especially with the Brian Burns trade. So I would say highest would be third round, but a higher than that would surprise me. And then you're asking if Jonathan Brooks, the uh, Texas running back, um, is within the Giants' sights. I mean, you know, that's that's hard to say. I mean, talented player. I personally think, um, you know, a mid-round um, running back, mid to late round running back. Like, look at Eric. Eric Gray was what? Fourth, uh, fifth round pick by the Giants. You know, a running back with some return value as they saw it. That's where I view the Giants more, you know, taking running backs. Um you know, I think he has the injury, right? Did he have an ACL? Um, you know, I think injuries are a concern right now. You're talking about the Giants and drafting players and uh, spending premium premium um, resources on guys, especially at 
positions where uh, the Giants have proven that they do not, you know, want to over invest. Uh, I think that's something to consider. I've said consistently, I think the, you know, Bucky Irving, Marshawn Lloyd, these two guys from the Pac-12, Corum obviously from Michigan's an intriguing prospect too. Um, you know, those are guys, those are guys that I would keep an eye on. I know Lloyd is a Lloyd's a shifty player, guy who the Giants like. Irving, I think, pass catching back. I, I like him a lot. I, I hope he gets in a good fit wherever it is. But yeah, you know, Brooks, he has the AGL or the ACL, I should say. Um so, and that's that that was what late season, right? November or so. Um, so I guess theoretically, what you're suggesting may be that you know you can get a you could get some value for a guy like that in the draft as far as where you're investing that pick. Uh, but the Giants, especially with where they've been, um, you know, as far as their injuries and managing that, you know, I think they're trying to steer clear of guys who are who they feel like aren't going to be available to them. J Jan 300 says, bro, thanks for all your, all you do. Indy Blackman safety. So I think you're talking about Justin Blackman or not, not Justin Blackman. Um, sorry. Um, Julian, right. Yeah. I knew it was a J <laughs> you're talking about Julian Blackman. Yeah. I mean, Still a free agent out there. Um, I think the Colts have been talking to him, though. I think the Colts had been, um, you know, they kind of put things on hold and then they re-engage with Blackman. But the Giants have a need there. I think you're smart, Jay, in bringing that up as far as a position where the Giants obviously said, we're not going to pay Xavier McKinney this kind of money. But they still have very much a need at that position, especially just like we talked about the other corner spot. You want to build this from the ground up and you want to have foundational pieces, Jay Jan. And thank you for the $2 super chat. I appreciate that uh, supporting the channel. But you also want some guys who have proven they can play in the league, who can help you steady the roster and kind of round out the roster, right? And so, you know, you, you have to balance the cost efficient nature of the draft and building it as a rebuild and as a true like ground up scenario with making sure you have players on your roster who can who have real tape nfl tape that show that they can produce and help you win games right and so you know um that's something to consider i mean blackman i think a couple of years ago he tore his achilles i believe um you know but had a uh you know a full 2023 uh, has set a career high in tackles, uh, eight passes defended. And, you know, Shane, Joe Shane actually said this, Jay Jan, to hit on something that you brought up because I like that you're bringing up like kind of like a value lingering on the roster or lingering on the market type player. Joe Shane said, like, remember everybody, like this is the roster building process is not over there. We have a lot of months to go even after the draft before we get to the season to figure out how we're going to put this together. Now you guys know as well as I that for every for every like Logan Ryan signing where it turns out the guy does have some good football left and becomes a really good like close to the regular season um addition, right? There are like five guys who the team signs last minute or at the start of camp or middle of camp or you know end of camp type things where you have an idea of how it's going to work out or the guy's going to fit, but it doesn't. Right. So uh, those have to be, those are targeted signings and they make sense, but you have to, you can't be counting on them as your number one solution. But thank you for raising that name. Good name. Haven't heard specifically. They're going to go after him, JJ. And I should say that, uh, but the giant, this is, you're talking about, um, you know, the type of secondary market now that the giants would be working and are working on, for, you know, there's the there's the reserve running back position, there's the corner position, there's the safety position, very much places on their roster that they have to upgrade and, and uh, reinforce. All right, let's get to the next question here. Um, oh, Jacob asked, any updates on how the JJ or May private workouts did? 
Um, I know that the McCarthy one went well. I talked to multiple sources who said that the Giants uh, Easter workout with McCarthy went well. So, um, you know, you're not often, I will say this, you're not often going to hear somebody come out of one of those and say, man, it was horrible, right? <laughs> this is not the time of year for people to start spreading those kind of things. Like no one really stands to gain from it. But I will say at the very least, if somebody told me it went poorly and they didn't want me to say anything, I probably would say nothing, right? Like it would be, I wouldn't lie to you and tell you, hey, it went well when it didn't. So that's just a little window into how I would operate in that scenario. You know, someone might say, hey, don't put this out there. I don't want to crush your kid, but he wasn't very good, right? So that would inform me the team is not going to take him or isn't, you know, uh, impressed by this player, but I'm not going to dump on the guy, right? So that would be a way to share information without spreading uh, gossip or something that would hurt somebody's draft stock, let's say. Jacob says to the fact Dable was watching Michael Penix's pro day and not Mays tell you anything, maybe their preference. Um, no, I believe Jacob. No. Uh, well, first of all, Drake may would be the pick. Like if the giants were in the market for those players, may would be the pick at six, whereas Penix would be the pick in the second round. That's how I view it as far as where you could value those players based on their injury histories, their games, all those things. Um, you know, as far as how teams are around the league value these guys and where you could uh, justify taking them necessarily. Um, the Washington pro day though, that is a stacked roster. And I can just tell you this right now. Like if there, if somebody asked me right now, like Pat, you have to pick one school that the giants are going to take at least one player from in this draft, which school is it? I would say Washington. That's what I would say. And I'm not saying that would definitely be Penix or, you know, Roma Madunze, but they have several receivers. They have a couple, you know, offensive linemen, a couple defensive players, Penix Jr. at quarterback. They're just stacked. Um, and, you know, obviously Alabama is usually like that every year. But I know the Giants and Shane, like they have a high opinion of that roster and that talent. You know, I remember even the Roger Rosengarten, I think his name is, the, the tackle, the right tackle was a guy working um, who had met with the Giants at the Senior Bowl. And, um, you know, I know there were some other teams who had their offensive line coaches at Washington's Pro Day looking at him and some other guys. Uh, but just an example. But that's what I would say. You know, my answer to that would be, no, I mean, to, to schedule a workout with May, you know, they had to make a decision there. Which Pro Day do we send the bulk of our resources to on the same day, Washington or UNC? Washington's the more talented roster, which also has, by the way, two potential targets in the first and second round for your team. So it makes more sense to invest those resources there for the pro day, but then still do your work with May separately. So no, it does not indicate preference one over the other. Uh, Jacob also says, if we were to go defense, do you think we would target McKinstry, Isaac, or Turner? I think going defense would be a pretty big head scratcher. <laughs> That's what I think. Given, you know, Listen, I know I'm banging the drum on the quarterback because it really does. They're behaving like a team is going to take a quarterback. But if you look at this roster and you look at their position group and skill group on offense, it's hard to it's hard to justify not taking a, a receiver or a tackle, to, you know, something to help the offense, especially given the offense last year. Like, do we forget how historically bad their offense was last year? Hirsch, what's going on? Good to see you, man, as always. I'm going to try to get through this queue. I know you guys have been waiting. Thanks for being patient. Chronicle says, hey, Pat, hope you had a good and blessed hot spring holiday with your family. Thank you, Chronicles. What have you heard about making calls about the first Penix possibility at right tackle if we get Penix? Um, trade back. QB, please. Chronicles, what I've, what I've heard about the trade idea is, you know, Joe Shane's going to exhaust all these possibilities. Um, he sensed the idea that he senses the idea that, uh, the top three could all go QBs. And I think he's prepared for all these scenarios, you know, Hey, I love this guy, this quarterback, but he's not going to be here. Or I like this wide receiver. Um, you know, but I also, and I also like this quarterback. So let's see how this falls and I'm going to maneuver and make sure, um, I try to get, go get my QB, but if I can't get him. I know this receiver is somebody I feel comfortable with on my offense. And now I've also done a lot of work on Michael Penix Jr. And maybe that's a guy I can get in the second and feel like I have an impressive quarterback on my roster 
right? While also upgrading the skill group. But you can flip it too, Chronicles. Like the the receivers, like you could get a really good receiver in the second round at 47 after p- taking that quarterback at six. Like being the Giants in this draft, now they have a lot of needs. Like even the idea that Jacob's answer asking about going defense in the first round. Like I know I just said it would be a little ridiculous in my mind to do that given the Giants' needs on offense and their what they did on offense last year or didn't do. Uh, but, you know, you could – like you can really make an argument that as the Giants, it would be it's it would be a, a great draft for you to take that quarterback in the first and still get a starting wide receiver that you feel you know like in a maybe a lot of other years could have been a first round talent um, in the second round. Like it's it's that intriguing of a wide receiver class. So um, I do think I do think that's something to remember is like if they don't go wide receiver in the first. Right, they could still get a wide out in the second, um, who could contribute immediately. They could also get an offensive lineman there. Like you asked about a defensive tackle, how high could they draft one? Like to me, you're drafting an offensive lineman ten out of ten times in that second round pick if you don't take one in the first over a defensive tackle given their roster right now. Daniel says, "Hey Pat, greetings from Brazil. Do you think we sign another free agent before draft day?" Ah, that's a good question, Daniel. Um, you know, I think, I think at this point, usually the way teams operate is when they get this deep into it, they kind of put the free agent stuff on hold. And especially remember they're coming in, like the giants are coming into their facility and starting their off season workouts on, I think the 15th, like two weeks from today, uh, um, on April 15th and Monday. And so when the Giants do that, they get their team in the building, their players in the building. They start really mapping it out, talking to these guys, seeing where everybody is health-wise. And sometimes that can lead to um, a pretty like pretty immediate understanding of, oh, maybe we need a little bit more here. Or maybe this guy's not as on track in his rehab as we expected. So now we got to add here, right? But usually you get this close to the draft, teams are all – immersed in their draft prep right now. And so typically they get to this point, they make their draft picks and then they settle it on the back end on the veteran side, um, you know, with contracts in that way. Candyman says, to be clear, I'm against trading that much away for any QB who isn't named Caleb Williams. Got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Candy, I'll say this. Like if you think, you know, if you're the Giants, this is one thing I do believe. Like I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and tell you guys, like I'm not a college football expert right now. I'm an NFL reporter and analyst and expert who, you know, I talk to as many people as I can to gain insight on these college prospects and to bring that to you. Right. But, you know, there's a lot of people who not only watch more college football than I do on a you know weekly basis, but also grind the film are closer to those players. Right. And so that's the type of thing where if, If the Giants decide, let's just throw out the name, like J.J. McCarthy, right? If the Giants decide that that kind of trade you outlined is worth J.J. McCarthy because they believe wholeheartedly he's the franchise QB, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say, uh, you know, and I'm just picking McCarthy as a name. You could use any of the other quarterbacks' names, Daniels, May, you know, Caleb. I do think it's an important enough position that if they decide this player is going to change our franchise and they want to go get him, and that's why, like with the Carolina Panthers last year with Bryce Young, they picked the wrong guy, it looks like, right? But, and they also traded DJ Moore, which is stupid. But the concept of feeling like it's time to be aggressive to go get our man, I don't disagree with that if you've, if you've done the homework and you've done the full evaluation. Now, obviously, the Carolina was reckless and that was driven by the owner as much as everybody else. Um, but the concept of believing wholeheartedly and taking your man um, and get, and putting your chips all in because you feel like you've done all the work and this is the guy who stands out and is going to lead your franchise. Like I'm behind that idea. So for you, that's Caleb Williams. But if that's somebody else for, for one of these teams, I don't begrudge them that. Chronicle says, is there any chance May falls to six? Seems like JJ could go top three at this point. Chronicle's, I personally, like, I think they're, how do I say this? (sighs) 
there are some people who will tell you that Drake may could fall to the towards the Giants pick and that McCarthy looks like he's rising to the top of the board. There are some people who think that in the end, despite all the chatter and all the strong, and it's not, it's not rumors, right? Like the Giants and other teams like the Broncos, they spent meaningful time with J.J. McCarthy, like a lot of resources on studying him, spending time with him. So it's not rumors, right? Um, but th- then there are some people who think when all is said and done, it'll probably settle back down towards, you know, May will be closer to the top of the draft, whereas J.J. McCarthy, he might come into the top 10 or the top 15, but the hype is overblown for a player who, while good and while a winner, is still developmental and not necessarily um, a can't-miss prospect like you would think a guy who was talked about uh, like McCarthy would be. So I would I would say Chronicles – I'm not. I'm going to be honest with all you Giants fans here right now. This is like head spinning time of this draft season, because you go from conversation to conversation with people, and you hear different things. <laughs> and so, it's worthwhile to um, have a good filter and really just to listen and to take it all in. And that's why, like, I I'm clear with you guys when I tell you something is information, something is my opinion based on what I hear, right? So. But that's my honest truth, Chronicles, is that depending on who you talk to depends on how they put guys like May and McCarthy in order. Colin Anderson says, hey, Pat, love the show. Thanks, Colin. Thanks for being here, man. Drinking an old fashioned tonight, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. So if you have a drink in hand, cheers. Colin says, do you think running back is a position we need to address in the draft? Colin, I do. Uh You know, Devin Motor Singletary, Motor being his nickname. Um, Singletary is a guy who can play for you on all three downs, but ideally is a good complement to other pieces in a backfield. Um, The Giants do have other running backs on their roster right now. Uh, But, you know, I was at the Senior Bowl at the Combine. They've they've been spending some some pretty good time and keeping their eyes on the the RBs. Like, you know, I, I thought it was noticeable. And keep in mind, like this is before Saquon Barkley signed somewhere else, uh, Philadelphia. <laughs> but this was before the Saquon Barkley free agency. And these are events where the Giants uh, running backs coach and the Giants are spending clear time evaluating these RBs, uh, keeping an eye on the Marshawn Lloyds, the Bucky Irvings, the Blake Corums. Those are the three names that keep jumping out at me. Um, I do think based on Shane's positional value, it's hard to see them investing a premium uh, pick in that position for sure. I think it would certainly be an eyebrow raiser, even though Saquon is not like 22, right? Um, I think it would be strange to let your best offensive weapon go because you don't value running back as much as the rest of the league and then invest a high pick in a running back. Uh, but I personally, I, I think Bucky Irving's uh, a, an exciting player. But all three of those running backs I just outlined. I know Marshawn Lloyd's a player they like. I know that. USC. Chronicles, any breaking news on this live, Pat? (laughs) Chronicles, appreciate you referencing that. So what Chronicles is talking about is last live chat we did, we came on with breaking news that the Giants were going to Ann Arbor for that private workout with J.J. McCarthy on Easter Sunday. So, you know. It's not every night I'm going to jump on these things with breaking news right out of the gate. But when I have it, I will. And that's going to be, you know, the more we do these and the the more this grows and um, the more eyeballs we get on here, the more that's going to happen on a regular basis. I can promise you that, Um, you know, and the more I have this going in the next season, like this will be the place to be for breaking Giants news because. We are going to make this like the landing page for consistent Giants dialogue and conversation for, you know, for fans who want to get the information from the inside. And I don't say that with any ego, but I mean, I am privileged enough to be in the Giants building minimum three days a week during the season plus games. Right. And also connected to all my sources in the organization and in the league and traveling to Super Bowl, Combine, Senior Bowl, NFL owners, right? And 
gleaning a lot of insight from these things, boots on the ground reporting. And so I'm so thrilled that we have this going now because I'm, I am writing for the daily news and I'm pouring everything I have into giving you guys good content there and on social media. But these live chats and this podcast, this talking about with Pat Leonard podcast and these live Q and A's, this is something that I'm committed to continuing to grow with you guys and turning into, um, and turning into a show. You know what I mean? Like this is where I want you guys to feel confident and comfortable to come in and a get breaking news, but also have a conversation like Candyman's when Candyman earlier suggested that, Hey, he says, Pat, like, you know, you think Kayvon Thibodeau would be part of a trade up for the giants to get a quarterback. If somebody put that on Twitter right now on X, if I, let's say I put that on X, Hey, we're talking on talking ball with Pat Leonard and uh candy man. One of our loyal listeners just said that, you know, Thibodeau could be part of a trade up to get a guy like Caleb Williams. And he just wanted to kind of workshop it and talk about it. Could you imagine how terrible that conversation would go on X, right? On a place like that. And listen, I use Twitter X, right? For all its good purposes, right? But what I'm saying is this is a constructive place to have those conversations. And Chronicles, I appreciate you referencing the breaking news because, you know, that made me happy to bring you guys unique information first. Like I didn't put that on Twitter or anywhere until I told you. And that's the, that's the honest truth. I heard that information. I saved it, held on to it, you know, confirmed it, did all that and waited till we went live and the hundred or 200 or whatever it was, people who were on here right at the start, you were the only ones who knew that information for, you know, five minutes, whatever it was. But that's what I want to continue to do here. And I'll get off my soapbox now, but this excites me. You can see it. So Daniel says, any news on how the Ann Arbor private workout went yesterday? Yeah. So, you know, as I said earlier, Daniel, and I know you probably asked it before my last answer, but, um, you know, really great, really great chat going on here. Um, so, yeah, it went well. I talked to multiple people who said it went well. George, what's going on? George, you got any more scuttlebutt for us from the NFL uh, meetings, man? You're you're our newsbreaker around here. Intel says two words, quarterback. Doug says, um, or QB, I guess, because quarterback's one word. Doug says, do you have any draft-related guests coming on the pod? I enjoyed the episodes with Tony Pauline last year. Yes, Doug, I do. Um, this is a great month for podcasting, for NFL podcasting. And I do have um, some primo guests coming up. Last year, we had people like Tony Pauline, Greg Cosell, Emery Hunt, I thought Emery, you know, brought it. All of them brought it. Those are really awesome episodes. Um, and I'm going to have, how many do I have lined up right now? I believe I have three podcasts lined up in the next week. Draft related, Giants related, and then more coming down the pike. I'm going to feed you a ton of information in the week and a half or so leading up to the draft. Uh, Tony um, should be back on. I'm never going to tell you definitely, hey, this guy will be on because people's schedules sometimes change. You got to kick interviews back a couple of days. So I don't want to tell you, hey, this guy's coming on Monday or this guy's coming on Tuesday and then it doesn't happen when it should. Um, but I will tell you, and I, thanks again, Doug, I will tease. You know, we had Phil Sims on already talking quarterbacks, Giants, Brian Bird, et cetera. There's a ton more coming on the Talking Ball with Pat Leonard podcast. You can get that wherever you get your podcast, Spotify, Apple, um, you know, overcast, whatever it is. And then also you can watch the video versions here. Tony says, P Len, what's up, Tony? Danny, Danny says, what's your honest opinion on Dan Jones? Do you want to see him start for year six? Yikes. Um, Danny, I'm more going off of like the giants are profiling like a team that knows that they need to go. Um, they're profiling like a team that knows that they need to go get a quarterback that can't rely on their current quarterback room. That's how they're acting. In my opinion. Um, my honest opinion on Daniel is when they used him more as a runner who could throw in 2022, 
And they, oh, you hear that? Wow. When they used him more as an owner who could throw, or a runner who could throw, and when they built the offense around the, let's say, the strengths and weaknesses of what they could and couldn't do in that first season. Now, listen, their offense still wasn't great, but they made plays. They they coached in a strategic way around their weaknesses, and they made the playoffs. Trying to open up and unlock Daniel Jones in a downfield passing game without a proper offensive line, without Daniel Jones making some uh, some of the right decisions in the red zone on third down, right? It just wasn't happening. So, like, do I think Daniel Jones could be on another team, a more well-rounded team, and be a capable starter? Yeah, no, I think I think he could. If the Giants were more well-rounded as a team and as a roster and better constructed, at better weapons, yeah, I think he could. But I do think the running for Daniel Jones is a big element in his game. And that's part of the reason why his injuries with the neck, is, they're so concerning. You know, they're concerning, let alone for any NFL player. But for a player like Daniel Jones, who whose strength is running the football, who sometimes doesn't protect himself appropriately when he's doing it, who's also taken a lot of hits already because he hasn't had great pass protection. It's just not a recipe for feeling confident about the future. You know, like I've, Take Daniel Jones's name off his jersey. Just tell me his track record and where his injury history stands and what he does well and doesn't do well. It's I'm not out on Daniel as an NFL player, but I am out on him as the Giants answer for the future. If that makes sense. And I think I think I think that's where the Giants are too, frankly. That's my opinion. What's up, Tony? All right. Hirsch says we're absolutely positively drafting a quarterback earlier in this draft. The only question is who and whether it's at number six or a trade up. Hirsch, I agree. I agree. Though, you know, it's funny. Somebody asked me the other day, Pat, like, you know, right now you have to say one player the Giants are drafting at six. Who is it? Who is it? And I said, uh, Malik Neighbors, right? Now I said that because, hey, the board's going to fall a certain way. Their preferred quarterback's not going to be there. And they'll just take a good player who can help them now, right? Like that was that was part of why I was saying that. Um, but um, yeah, I agree with you. They're acting like a team that's going to take a quarterback. That's how they're acting. It's just how they're acting. Mark says uh, Michael Penix is <laughs> moving up the board. <laughs> Not falling for that. Um, let's see. Jay Jan says, is Frank Gore Jr. a good pick in rounds four or five? Oh, interesting. Thanks for the super stickers and the super chats there, guys. Mark says, do you want to bet a Philly cheesesteak that Penix goes number 20 or earlier? Mark, I, I personally would uh, – I view him as worthy of a pick of above 20. I just have no indication right now someone's going to draft him that high given his injury history. So um, come back to me closer to the draft, and I probably will make that bet with you. <laughs> I want to say yes, but we'll wait a little bit longer. But I probably will make that bet with you. All right, let's try to get through some of these questions here. You guys are uh, being very patient. I appreciate you. All right. Chronicle says Blackman is a name that continues to come up connected to the Giants. Any possibility there? We'll see. Um, Intel says that would be stupid. Uh, Danny says Giants could have had Josh Allen defensive end right now. We would not need to trade Dan. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's long in the past, though. Um, just draft a QB, says Intel. Molly Mall says what moves made so far make you think they're drafting a quarterback? If they do draft a quarterback, does that mean we're cutting DeVito? Or are we keeping four quarterbacks? I'm not understanding. Molly Mall. Um, well, I don't, I personally don't view, and I don't think the Giants view Tommy DeVito as like a viable option at quarterback for them in 2024. Like, you know, uh, I know they won a few games with him being in the game last season, but, um, you know, I'm not sure that would, I, I don't think Tommy DeVito's presence prevents them from drafting a quarterback that doesn't that doesn't track for me um you know Daniel I think his injury history you have Drew Locke in here to possibly play some meaningful games for them uh but 
they don't have a quarterback for the future in the building. So that's that's the that's the part that to add up. And also Molly Mall, like I guess my question back to you would be why do you think they're going to scout all these quarterbacks right now and they're having private workouts and Brian Dable's going on the road to look at all the quarterbacks? Like why why do you think they're doing that when you th- what you're acting almost like it would be ridiculous for them to take a quarterback? Um which I think is strange because that, you know, teams don't fly around the country and no, I'm, I'm literally asking, but teams don't fly around the country and do this kind of work. If they're not considering strongly drafting one, Joe says all four quarterbacks are going ahead of the giants at six, but a nice consolation is Malik neighbors. That could very well be could very well be blazing. Brazen says Malik neighbors is going to wear number four for the giants next season. Uh, Joe says Michael Penix will be in the top 15. Interesting. Chronicle says Bo Nix is bad. Molly Mall says it seems like all fans care about is drafting a QB, even if he isn't good. Why doesn't anybody care about building a team? Do you feel like trading up makes them better this year? Well, so I, okay, that uh, Molly Mall, that's a fair question and point about, you know, what resources you're expending. But so like, Let's say they can't get into the top three because obviously right now it looks like um, that might be hard to do, not only for the Giants, but for anybody. But so maybe three quarterbacks go ahead of, let's say the top three take QBs, but then Arizona drafts a player at four. And then the Chargers are on the clock at five and the Vikings are trying to trade up to six or to, to five with the Chargers to get, J.J. McCarthy, the fourth quarterback, or Drake May, or whoever it is. You know, in 2017, the Bears traded one spot from number three to number two. Remember, they flipped with the Niners. They took Trubisky at two. Solomon Thomas went to the Niners at three. The Bears gave up um, the, the number three pick to move to two, and then they gave up a third and a fourth that year and a third the next year. So trades up can look different. Like that, you know, it doesn't have to be the mortgage, the farm trade next year's first round pick to get into the top three type type trade. It could be a trade up to protect your turf, depending on how the board falls. Right. And it could be like, hey, Shane wanted to maybe go to go up to the top three, couldn't get there. So then that's the next move. Right. So, that, you know, there's different ways it can happen. Um, and Molly Mall, I don't think that. I don't think, you know, fans want to draft a quarterback no matter whether he's good or not. I don't think that's the case. I think it's, again, I think like it's hard to, it's hard to explain like that other than just to say you don't do all this work on these quarterbacks and not take seriously drafting one. Like you just don't do it. It's not smokescreen. It's not a smokescreen. It's very real interest. Obviously though, Molly, The Giants make their list of preferences, how they feel about these prospects, and not everybody's going to be the guy who you say, well, like like the Giants aren't going to sit at six and say, whichever quarterback falls to us, we're taking him. Like that's not, you know, that's not how teams operate, right? They have guys they like and guys they don't, right? So Michael says, I think neighbors is the Giants pick unless they are fooling us and hope JJ falls to them. Um. I mean, the Giants wouldn't be fooling anybody if they took JJ McCarthy based on their based on how they've been acting. Uh, Molly Mall says Dable says he evaluates quarterbacks every year. The Giants have been all over the quarterbacks this year, more so. Uh, you know, the, the the people people around the league um, view this as uh, a team in the market for a quarterback. Dable also said he expected Wink Martindale to be back. So <laughs> remember that. Joe says, uh, AZ, if Arizona trades out to, say, the Vikings, then Marvin Harrison Jr. could end up at six. If, Marv is at, if Marvin Harrison Jr. is at six after four quarterbacks go in the top four or whatever, like that card is in, <laughs> right? Blazin Brazen says, oh, my God, please no more basketball school, school quarterbacks. Come through, Pat. <laughs> Description says, what's up? Uh, Joe says those two wins over Washington and New England. Ouch. Yeah, you're not kidding. D. Kitt says if the Giants take a wide receiver at six, then what's the long-term plan at quarterback? 
Well, D kit. That's so Molly. I love that Molly Maul is bringing like the opposite viewpoint on the quarterback conversation because D kit. So D kit now comes back from the other side of, but if you don't take a quarterback, what's the plan, right? Is the plan cross your fingers that Daniel Jones is healthy. And if not, Drew Locke starts 15 games for you or 10 games for you or eight games for you. And then what does the team look like, right? Brian Dable's is Brian Dable even the coach next, you know, the the year after with that kind of plan? I mean, D Kit, um, you know, here's what I'll say. I view it as literally impossible for the Giants to come out of this draft without taking a quarterback somewhere in it. You know, obviously the board could fall different ways. Um, anything's possible, but I don't under I would not understand the Giants not taking a quarterback this year somewhere in the first, you know, three rounds. I mean, you you know, I don't know where Joe Milton from Tennessee is gonna go, you know, a prospect like him with all the measurables, who you feel like you can continue to mold, um, you know, and you feel like Brian Dable could continue to help unlock. Like those are things obviously to keep an eye on later in the draft. Um, but the giants are a team that now listen, and I know, I know this. Okay. So like, this is not me speculating. Like the giants are, you know, like I, I, okay. I asked Brian Dable at the NFL, uh, NFC coaches breakfast in Orlando sitting right next to him. And I asked Brian Dable, I said, Brian, you know, is there something to be said for what the Packers have done? And trying to get a quarterback in your building where he's not playing right away and he can develop, take the reins and like create that consistency. You know, and he said, yeah, you know, I would take three quarterbacks in 30 years or whatever it was, you know, with Favre and Rodgers and Jordan Love. The Giants, ideally, like they would love to get a quarterback in their building that they're not going to start right away and they're going to work with and groom. They love that idea. And it's hard to blame them. Why would anybody not like that idea? Now, that doesn't mean you can just execute it exactly the way you envision it, right? Because other teams have these picks. Other teams are in the quarterback market. But without question, the Giants are interested in getting a rookie quarterback in the building that they can work with as they also give Daniel Jones one more chance. And as they bring in drew lock to try to reinforce the quarterback room, like it would be malpractice to go into this coming season with Jones, with two neck injuries and an ACL drew lock and Tommy DeVito as your quarterback room. How could you do that? You can't do that. Joe says hard to beat the Vikings two first number one picks. So that you're talking about right. The two first round picks. So that's number 11 and 23 in a trade up, unless they include some 2025 picks. Yeah, we've talked about this here before, but the Giants' first-round pick next year could be very high. So I know Joe Shane already wouldn't be somebody eager to trade his first-round pick. But on top of that, I mean, the pick that that could be is just, uh, you know, would just be a kick in the gut um, to give up that pick and watch what it turns into, especially if you don't hit on that player. Um, Obviously, there is the argument of, well, you might not be trading your own first round pick, right? That might be the next GMs. Like for example, Dave Gettleman, Joe Judge regime, right? Joe Judge, you know, ends up making that trade back and they get to Kadarius Tony, but they get the extra first round pick from the Chicago Bears the following year, number seven overall, it turns out that he acquired in that trade moving back so the Bears could go get Justin Fields. But Dave Gettleman and Joe Judge never get to use that pick. Joe Shane gets that pick uses it on Evan Neal, right? Cave on Thibodeau, Evan Neal. But there's also something to always be said for, um, you know, well, whose draft pick am I playing with there, right? If this is going to help me now and help this team now and help us get better, right? And it's what it takes. Maybe I have to, you know, take a deep breath and do it. So, you know, those are those are kind of the conversations and decisions. D Kit checks in with a $10 super chat and a super sticker. D Kit, thank you so much. Appreciate you, man. D Kit says, Pat, 
when you think about the choices with Daniel Jones injuries and Locke's past performance, if they don't take one at six, the chances of landing a potential long-term solution at quarterback dwindles drastically. Yes, D kid, that's true. Um, you know, the one thing I'll say is that Michael Penix Jr., he is an intriguing prospect, especially from this standpoint. Now, okay, okay, listen, his draft injury is impossible. His draft history is impossible to ignore, right? Penix's draft history is impossible to ignore. So I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, yeah, forget it. You know, forget his injury history. You, you know, he'd be, he would change your team, right? He'd be fine. But um, one second, sip of the, sip of the old-fashioned here. You know, I remember talking to Phil Sims the other day. I'm going to put this clip up on YouTube, uh, you know, this week. He basically said, whichever team drafts Michael Penix Jr., that team's starting quarterback is going to look at Penix in his first in his first mini camp with the team and go, what the hell is he doing here? <laughs> right? Like that he's that kind of that he looks that impressive, that he can throw that well, that he will uh open eyes immediately, right? And he will put pressure on the starter. So, you know, that's something to think about is this idea of if the Giants are trying to split the baby, so to speak, and I'm not advocating that that's the absolute right thing. I'm just saying if they can't get up to certain quarterbacks in the top or they or they really like a receiver and they want to get Penix in the second and you do some kind of mechanism to do that, can Penix Jr. help your quarterback room, help push your quarterbacks in your room right now, right? You're also improving the team in the first round by upgrading a position of need, a premium position of need, wide receiver, tackle, whatever it is, you know, so, uh, you know, that's D kit. That's like a, that's a scenario where, okay, maybe they don't get a guy at six, but they still kind of address, like, I'm just, you know, I'm throwing out a scenario that I think they might envision could work. But I do come back to the fact that the Giants is a team that's really trying to get away from relying on guys with injury histories. They do the Darren Waller trade, bites them, right? So I, I still think in the end, them investing a pick in a guy like Michael Penix Jr. would be surprising based on that. Um, but, you know, that's also, uh, you know, that's also a player that they're clearly spending a lot of time on and they have a lot of interest in. And like I said, I've been at all these off season uh, throwing sessions with uh, you know, from the senior bowl to the combine with Penix and he's the best thrower on the field both times. So Jay Jan also checks in with another two bucks. He says, I keep hearing about a guard from UConn in the third. I will say Jay Jan, and thanks again for the uh, support. I will say that, uh, offensive guard, I think, is a position. You know, I've said this before. I know I, I identified the kid from Illinois um, as somebody to watch that they were spending a lot of time with at the Senior Bowl. But keep an eye on offensive guard in the draft. You know, keep an eye on offensive guard. Back into the queue. And uh, D, D Kit, thanks again. Thanks again. Really appreciate it. All right. Back into the queue. Uh, Blazing Brazen says with the 47th pick in the second round, Giants to select TJ Tampa, cornerback from Iowa State. Corner, they need a corner. They need another corner, that's for sure. And obviously Shane proved that when he needs a corner, he will draft on with a high pick. Deontay Banks first round. D Kit says, does anyone really have an idea of what the Giants are planning to do at six? I think I think Joe Shane's keeping all of his options open. I think he's honest when he says that, that trading back, picking, or trading up are all on the table. Um, D kid, I, I just, I'm telling you guys my opinion on the fact that, you know, they're, they're doing as much work on a quarterback as anybody and they're in that market until they're out of it. But, you know, you could say this and D kid, the answer, the short answer is obviously no, nobody knows for sure. Right. But you could make the same argument about the Washington commanders, for example, at two or the Patriots at three that you can make about the giants right now at six, which is, Hey, does this need, does this team need a quarterback? Yes. But let me adjust this. Let me adjust this light real quick. Does this team need a quarterback? Yes. But does this team also need um, a wide receiver? 
a linebacker, a defensive tackle, an offensive guard, an offensive tackle, a tight end, a corner, right? Like these are teams that they're picking high in the draft for a reason, right? And so when the Giants are picking this high, the Commanders, you could say it about, the Patriots, you could say it about, these are teams that have premium quarterback needs, but they, you, if you say to me, if I say to you, the Giants took a receiver instead of a quarterback or they took a tackle instead of a receiver, you could nod to me and say, I understand why they did because X, Y, Z, because they're not good enough at this position, because they need more depth, because they need higher end talent, right? So that's part of the reason people don't know for sure, because these teams, the Giants, the Commanders, the Patriots, they have so many darn needs, right? It's even look at the Chargers with Harbaugh. They just got rid of their two top wide receivers, but he also likes to build up the line and go big. But you can make an argument for either. If they took a, a receiver or they took a, an offensive lineman, everyone's going to nod their head and say, yep, they needed that, right? So, um, you know, I just think, uh, D. Kit, from my experience covering the league and from talking to people around the league, you know, the Giants are the Giants are acting like a team that wants to draft a quarterback. That's how they're acting. Joe says wide receiver at six. They see how they finished in 2020. Oh, they will see how they finish in 2024 for a 2025 draft QB. They are in a tough spot. They are in a tough spot. If that's what they do, I mean, you know, roll the dice, right? That would be the that would be Joe Shane putting his faith in John Mara that. Um, well, it's interesting because if you're Brian Dable, right, you could be saying those Luxardo cherries, by the way, for the old fashions, top notch. If you're Brian Dable, you want the wide receiver to help your offense now, you could argue, right, at, at six. But you could also say you want that quarterback in the building to then show how you're developing them to kind of reinforce to them why they hired you, right? But it'll be interesting to see how that plays out because if Joe Shane, for example, uh, drafts the, the young quarterback, does not improve the current offense with that first-round pick in the immediate future if the guy's not starting right away, are you counting on as the GM, John Mara, saying, yep, this is still a steady process. We're still building this, right? But you just let your top offensive player and Saquon Barkley walk out of the building. It's a really, you know, I'm just throwing out all these ideas because, as Joe said, they're in a tough spot. Whatever door you open or whatever door you close, another one opens, right, as far as, like, the needs you're addressing and the issues that can arise and the consequences that you can have based on what you take and don't take in this draft. Blazin Brazen says, Joe Shane is misdirecting people like a junk traffic cop. Usually where Joe Shane spends his time and resources is where he has his eye and where he's going. <laughs> Chris P says, I don't think the Giants know what the Giants are doing at six. <laughs> D. Kitt says, well, Chris, you and I both know just how true that is. Well, to D. Kitt's point, and I said this earlier, but Joe Shane has said this a lot, D. Kitt, that their process isn't over yet. So, you know, like I said in my question to him, this was a, something I had heard before from one of the, what was it? Somebody in hockey maybe, or, but like the idea of the hay. Oh, Pat, oh, Pat Shermer said this. He wants the hay in the barn, right? Meaning like the game plan is all in first or all their evaluations are in and everything's tied up and, you know, airtight and, They've completed their process and now they get to the decision making because they've done all of their work and in the lead up. And so when you say they don't know what they're doing, like Joe Shane, that's what he was saying when he said, you know, like a lot of people are asking him about trade activity and phone calls and if a move's going to happen, are the Vikings going to jump over you? And his consistent answer is, you know, nothing's going to happen until, you know, a couple of weeks into April, closer to the draft because everybody, including the top teams, are not done with that process. Hirsch says, Shane is misdirecting more than Garmin navigation. Well, 
the misdirection, frankly, Hirsch, I mean, the misdirection, if there was only a misdirection, it would be that they were going to go defense, which I don't think would be, would make, like I said, don't think makes much sense. I mean, even if they go offensive tackle at six, that's not misdirection to me at all. I mean, you know, that would be drafting at a position they haven't gotten right. You know what I mean? Um, I do think not taking a quarterback, depending on how the board falls, would be misdirection in the sense that, you know, listen, if only two quarterbacks go and the picks ahead of them and they don't take one, that would be misdirection. But I, I think that's hard to see. Let's see. We got Mark says, uh, yes, old fashioned. That's right. Um, thanks for the super sticker. Chris says, just remembered that there are more than three wide receivers. That is correct. Uh, D kit says your point is correct. This regime won't survive another 2023. That's right. Neighbors won't transform this offense alone. Six eleven or worse will be the end as it should. Should it, in your opinion, D kit, should that be, um, the end for Shane too, or just able because right now, like if you talk to people in the league right now, a lot of people don't think they think Shane would survive another tough year and Dable would not. I think Dable would not. And then it's a question based on why it goes wrong with Shane. But I do think with the Giants history, normally their track record is the GM has a longer shelf life um, than the head coach. All right, let's get back into the queue here. Joe says neighbors and uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. or quarterback at six is my guess. D Kit says, I can't wrap my head around taking wide receiver at six. Uh, Blazing Brazen says, we can't let neighbors go by if he's at six. Jo neighbors, he's a pretty serious talent. Joe says, wide receiver is where the premium picks are, along with quarterback at the top of the draft. Let's see. D Kit says, yes, we can let neighbors go if he's there. Chris says, dream scenario, Giants trade six, Daniel Jones and Drew Locke to New England for pick number three. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, you're killing me. So you're saying you're saying the Patriots would give up the third pick to take on Jones and Locke into a quarterback room with Brissett and take the sixth pick. Hmm. You got to take on that contract too, though. Yeah, D Kit says and Neil. Oh, important, important qualifier there. Chris P says, I think we can fix Evan Neal. An optimistic man there. We will see. Um, right. Joe says, New England would say that's a nice April Fool's offer. Um, yeah, I love this. Is This is a great example, too, of our community getting going and you guys talking in the chat while we're also talking out here. Uh, remember, this is the Talking Ball with Pat Leonard live Q&A. Uh, we do these twice a week during the offseason season. When travel and other things don't get in the way, Mondays and Thursdays, 9 p.m. Also, the Talking Ball with Pat Leonard podcast with more special guests coming up throughout the next few weeks leading up to the NFL draft. We break news on these when we have it. Last live chat, we introduced right at the top. We told you first here in this live chat that the Giants were working out J.J. McCarthy on Easter Sunday in Ann Arbor. I told everybody in this chat that exclusively before we went to social media and told the rest of Giants Nation and the NFL fan base and people uh, following this from around the world. We have an international fan base here at Talking Ball. Um, but, you know, remember, you can follow me here, uh, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Threads. I'm PL on NFL. And on Threads, I'm PL, PL on NFL as well. And on X or Twitter, I'm P Leonard NYDN. Of course, the Daily News and New York Daily News, nydailynews.com um, slash sports. You can find all my columns and reporting there. And, you know, the podcast, wherever you get it, Apple, Spotify, and the video pods, always available here. I uh, have a lot of good content on YouTube, but more coming from me. Uh, so keep an eye out for that as we go through the off season, through the draft, and into the regular season in 2024. Um, let's see. Hey, super unknown. Happy Easter to you as well. He says, looks like Evan Neal is going to be um, three-fourths rounder for the Giants next year. 
uh, is it true he won't move to guard? You're saying is it true Evan Neal won't move to guard? Well, he said on the record, super unknown, that he views himself as a tackle. He was born to be a tackle. He's not a guard. He said that last year. Uh, so, yes, he has articulated that he does not want to move there. They have had conversations behind the scenes since then that we are not privy to. Um, I do know, and I reported earlier this offseason, the Giants' intention was to start him at tackle and give him a chance to win that job. But signing Jermaine Illuminor, who was somebody who I targeted from day one of writing about the Giants' free agent plans, the idea there is to have a more valuable backup option if Andrew Thomas or Evan Neal goes down, but also a guy who can compete with Evan Neal at right tackle, maybe steal the job, also has experience at guard. So in the ideal scenario that Evan Neal figures it out, you have Andrew Thomas, Illuminor, uh, Neal, you have Runyon, you have Schmitz, and you have the guys that are going to add in the draft is they are not done adding offensive linemen. Um, you know, but, you know, that's something I'm working on too is writing on and reporting out whether the Giants have – how much more they have to do on the offensive line because I know they're excited about Carmen Brasillo, the new O-line coach, and what he did with the Raiders. Illuminor followed him from the Raiders. Um, but – and obviously they added James Ferentz as an assistant O-line coach – uh, good player, smart guy, uh, but definitely a position group that still to me looks incomplete. Um, and, you know, super unknown, really, if, if Evan Neal, if they start him at tackle or they give him that chance to compete, that's all, that's what they owe him after the misdiagnosis of the injury last year. Um, you know, if he loses that job, he loses that job and then it's kicking the guard time or else, you know. Molly Mall says, we don't need a wide receiver. We need a true number one. Yeah, no, that's fair. Chris P says, Bobby Johnson doesn't work here anymore. Maybe Neil can improve. Yeah, I think you got to be careful about scapegoating a coach just because the organization did, though. I would be careful about that. Joe says, I just don't see Michael Penix Jr. falling to the second round. Stock is rising after that pro day. According to who? I'll be shocked if he's not selected before 15 or 20 in the first. Listen, Joe, I think that Penix is, you know, he looks like a guy who's a stud. Uh, but you're talking about investing a premium resource in the player and his future. So that's the difference. You know, it's not about whether he's that good of a player. It's about whether you can expend the resource on that player. D Kid says, I think you have to look at it this way, Pat. They need to go quarterback at six. And in this deep draft through about 120 players, they should get another three starter quality players with the next three picks. Yeah, if you draft well, for sure. Molly Mall says, the people from Big Blue Kickoff Live believe we're drafting a wide receiver. They're not as sold we're getting a quarterback unless one of the three falls. Don't know who to believe at this point. Of the three, Molly, are you talking about, obviously, I'm assuming you're talking about Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, and Drake May, as I assume who you're talking about. Um, you know, so you think they wouldn't take McCarthy then at six, or you're saying the big blue kickoff people don't think they would take McCarthy at six. Listen, that's, that's a, you know, that's a, that's plausible. I mean, nobody know like you, like we were saying earlier, how many quarterbacks are the giants in love with? Are they, in, are they in love with Caleb Williams and that's it? Are they involved in love with Caleb Williams and Jaden Daniels and Drake may, and that's it. Is it Caleb Williams and JJ McCarthy? And that's it. Right. Like they have shown a lot of time and interest in these guys. Michael Penix Jr. is a part of that, right? They've shown a lot of interest in these players. But, um, you know, there's no guarantee that they're not going to be in love with all of them. And so that's why the scenario that you're outlining from Big Blue Kickoff Live, that's a possibility. You know, that's a possibility. But, you know, I just – I guess the, the point I'm trying to get across is – you don't go through the scouting process the Giants are going through right now with all these quarterbacks and fall in love with a few of them and not expend resources to try and go and get them and not be aggressive and not, you know, take a quarterback if one of your guys is there. Like winning, winning out of the top three could be the reason in the end they don't take one because they won themselves out of the players that they would have taken, but this is not a smokescreen. This is not the giants trying to misdirect people. 
This is them doing meaningful targeted homework on quarterbacks that they could conceivably consider as their guy that they want to draft. Like that's what's happening. That doesn't mean they're not taking a wide receiver at six, obviously. But I'm just saying like that, that's the point I'm trying to get across. The process is targeted towards evaluating quarterbacks they could draft. Uh, let's see. So Chris, Chris, you say you, you don't see Michael Penix Jr. dropping below 16. Joe says he agrees. You guys tell me this. You think Michael Penix Jr. is worth the number six overall pick for the Giants? If you think he's going to go in the top 16, do you think, do you want the Giants to take him at six? Honest question. Super unknown says one more, Pat. Yahoo had an article that stated Burns could be a risk. Really? Um, well, it was an overpay and it was a risk in that sense. I think it was, you know, a move out of desperation for a regime that needs to show some progress and win some games. Um, you know, is he worth what they paid him? We will see. He has to prove that. I mean, they paid him for what they think he's going to become, not what he is, right? He's shown some promise, but they're paying him to become something more. And so, you know, they believe in the guys and they went and got him. So, yes, it's a risk in the sense that, um, you know, you need him to play up to that, I guess. Um, I have to read that story, though. I didn't see that article. D. Kitt says it is highly likely that six quarterbacks go in the first round. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's possible. Um, I, yeah, I mean, Penix Jr., I mean, again, it's about the resources. Joe says JJ is overhyped. That's possible. Michael says, I have heard too. If Giants want him bad, they can try and move up to mid 20s. Who are you talking about? JJ? Molly Mall says, Carolina didn't necessarily pick the wrong guy. Drafting any quarterback and not surrounding with significant talent never works. People forget Mahomes was drafted by a playoff team. Right. Mahomes was drafted the same way the Packers end up doing it a lot of the time. Mike says, is it possible to get a Dunze and Penix? Yes. Um, but again, I think there's a disagreement here, you know, and listen, I don't, I think Michael Penix Jr. is a first round talent. I'm just saying, is the momentum there for the resources to be expended on a guy in the first round with that injury history? That's a, that's a big question, you know? Um, so you guys, obviously, or a lot of the people on here feel if you take a Dunze at six and you're waiting for Penix in the second round, you're not going to get him. Now, that might be possible. I mean, I legitimately wrote a story three weeks ago coming out of the combine <coughs> that, like, basically, I didn't care what anybody said about Penix and injury history in second round. This guy's a first-round talent. Someone will take him there, right? So – that's how I felt after watching him in person coming fresh off of that. So I felt exactly the way you guys did, but the bottom line is, um, you know, my recent conversations have not turned up people saying they think he's going to go as high as I think his talent would warrant, but I don't know. I mean, I don't know. You know, this is uh this is a crazy part of the season. All right. Chris says, unfortunately, we only have about 15 to 20% of the evaluation. We get the tape and whatnot, but not the interviews to get a well-rounded idea on the prospects. That's what I'm here for, Chris, to tell you what I know about how those behind-the-scenes conversations are going. Um, and I do know guys like Drake May and J and uh, JJ McCarthy, they light up those interviews. You know, that's what you hear. Um, I, to be honest, I haven't heard anything negative you know, a lot of times there's always one or two prospects around the top of the draft who you start hearing like bad stuff about. I haven't heard any negatives about how any of the guys, how any of these young men are presenting themselves to the teams. Uh, Joe says, hey, Pat, do you have a date when the Giants are doing uh, a private workout with May? Um, no, not a specific date. I know it's um, I know it's something that the Giants um, – you know, they've been on the road here uh, doing work on these other top quarterbacks, and they kind of had this area of um, of the pre-draft process coming off the owners' meetings carved out for them to 
start ramping up that prospect or that process. So we're in the window here right now for all of that to go down. Um, let's see. D kit says, Pat, I give you a hard time sometimes, but the truth is you're really the only guy left who questions things. I appreciate it. Don't sell out. D kit. Thanks, man. No, and you know what? I, um, thank you so much for the, for the extra five there and for, uh, for the support D kit. And also like D kit, I think not only do I question things, but also, I like being challenged, whether it's by one of your guys' opinions on a player or a tough question or, you know, forcing me to back up my information with, um, you know, with uh, additional insight or context or, you know, pushing back and making me like create a stronger argument for something or reinforce why uh, something is the way it is or to dig deeper into something as reporting. I welcome all of that. Um you know, I, like everybody else, don't love the kind of conversation that happens sometimes on like places like Twitter or X where somebody's just being nasty to you for no reason other than they hate the way you talked about their team or characterized something or whatever. But I, I hope one thing that you guys get here when we have these conversations is no axes to grind here. Like, you know, but I am a reporter, like you said, who is my job is to try to get to the truth, to bring it to you guys, to entertain you, but also bring you the truth. And really, you know, it's exhausting for me to cover losing football. I know it's more exhausting for fans to endure constant losing when they're hoping their team's going to turn things around. But we as reporters being around teams day in and day out, you want these teams to experience some success, to uh, lock up these players and good guys long-term and to foster like long-term good relationships and to uh, be there has with a front row seat to the winning and to the success and to that process, you know, the liftoff, so to speak. And so hopefully we're having this conversation in a few years, whether it's with this regime or the next regime. And we're talking about the, the dark days and how uh, thank God we're not in those anymore, you know, but, D kit. Thanks for saying that, man. I appreciate that. And I appreciate your, uh, your financial support tonight, as well as uh, very smart questions and insight. All right, let's get back into the queue here. Um, I know I'm, I know I'm slogging through this, but you guys really are participating at a high clip tonight, which I really appreciate. Um, all right. Let's see. Danny says Texans roster was among the league's worst and CJ Stroud is a difference maker. Uh, yeah. Also, you know, the Texans are an example of a team that they had some offensive linemen, but they added some playmaking wide receivers to the mix, you know, Tank Dell along with the Nico Collins, you get the quarterback and now you're pushing the ball down the field. Your pass protection is not perfect. Right. And then you have a head coach who looks like he's the real deal, right? So things come together. But I think Danny Duds makes a good point here. And he's saying that if you hit on the quarterback, it makes everything else look a little better, makes your meals taste a little bit better, right? Like that's the truth. D Kit says the fact that most teams are picking at the top of the draft are bad. The Bears have the Panthers pick. The next three are Commanders, Patriots, and Cardinals. Top QBs usually go to bad teams. True. Um. Joe says top three picks are with QB needy teams, unfortunately, for the Giants. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, and remember, and Joe Shane noted this recently, too. They all traded quarterbacks off their roster already this offseason. Patriots traded Mac Jones. Robert Kraft said that he wants a high-end or top elite something young quarterback out of this draft. So we all know what that means. Um, you know, the commanders, they trade Sam Howe to Seattle. And they have Marcus Mariota and a gaping hole in their roster. They have a new offensive coordinator, coach and GM, Cliff Kingsbury being the OC there. Um, that's obviously something to watch closely. Uh, hard to imagine they don't take a quarterback there, even though they have all those needs on their roster. And then, you know, first overall pick, uh, people consider that a slam dunk to be Caleb Williams. So, Joe, you're not wrong in the sense that it's tough to envision getting up into the top three, even though Joe Shane said the door isn't shut. D Kit says, should Carolina not have picked a quarterback because their team was awful? 
Oh, uh, oh no, I wasn't. No, I no, I wasn't. Um, I wasn't saying they shouldn't have picked a quarterback. I was talking about like the heavy nature of the investment, and then one of their picks turns out to be the number one overall pick next year in relation to how the Giants would gauge trying to make an aggressive move up. Like let like let's say the Bears answered the Giants' phone call tomorrow and said, you know what? We'll entertain a trade offer for number one. Here's the price. And it includes this year's number one, next year's number one, the one in 2020. Uh, so it would be 24, 25, and 26 number ones and a two and a player. And a, you know what I mean? Like if that, if something like that came up, um, I'm just saying that's a cautionary tale with the parent, with what the parents gave up or Panthers gave up for Bryce Young. And of course, you know, it does look like after, I know it's only one year, but Stroud really was that good for the Texans this year. So doesn't mean Bryce Young can't succeed, but clearly CJ Stroud was ready to play in the NFL, right? Ralph says, what should be a hot commodity in the draft is a speedy return man with the new NFL rules. Ralph, well said. That is well said. Um, you know, a position and a type of flex skill and talent that, you know, like, listen, the result was poor, but Last year, the Giants drafted Eric Gray as a running back who they viewed as a return man. Now, they were wrong about that, but that was that's the process, right? Is like you're you don't want to ideally like either an elite return man or a guy who, um, you know, a guy who can provide position flex and, and have that skill. I said before, I've said again, I'll say again, I think Jay Sean Corbin on the Giants roster right now should get a chance to do that for the Giants. Mark says, like and subscribe, brothers. Pat is putting out fantastic content, these live Q&As. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate you, man. Yeah, hit that like button, everybody. If you like what we're doing here, hit the like button. That engagement uh, literally drives through the YouTube algorithm uh, it tells people what we're doing here. It drives engagement. It uh, brings people to our channel. It gets recommended to people while we're live. Um, helps a lot. Chris says, D Kit, I bet Pat would enjoy being in our daily Twitter X spaces. You know, I see Authentic running some Twitter spaces um, too. You know, I see him running those too. I see you guys doing those on Twitter. Uh, maybe I'll jump in one of these days. D Kid says, probably Chris, but we would definitely put him to the test. Oh boy. Yo Swim says, trade back and get more lottery tickets. There are too many holes to fill in the Giants. We can get a wide receiver like Jermaine Burton from Alabama in the later rounds. We are married to Daniel Jones this year, anyways. Yeah, we'll tell that to the head coach who probably won't be coaching in 2025 if this team doesn't win games, though. Or have any arrows pointing up. Jim Osborne, what's up, Jim? What about a talking ball podcast during the draft for nights one and two? Jim, that's something I've been thinking about how to do that because the Giants during the draft, we're sitting in the facility in like a communal room. And so um, we're in a room together with uh, all the reporters just in one, like we all have our cubicles or whatever it is. So I don't have a private area to do it there because when the Giants pick, then they call us in and we go in and do, um, you know, a press conference immediately, you know, with the GM or the coach, whether it's at the end of the round or after the pick. And so um, I have thought about that, Jim. And so I, I think that's, I think that's worthwhile figuring out some way to do it. it. Logistically, I'm not sure how I can pull it off with the giants and the setup we have there, but I, would you guys all love to do that? Do, do something live like this during the draft? Let me know if you would. I think that's a good suggestion, Jim. D Kit says, problem with that, Pat, is teams found it easy to game plan for Jones as a runner. Uh, I think you're talking about like how they ran the offense last year. No, for sure that for sure defense is adjusted early this year to what they were calling. But the part of the reason is they were running some of the same exact stuff too. I mean, you could you could throw some different variations and wrinkles at teams. You don't have to run the same stuff. Um, so, but no, DK, you're right about that. But I also think league wide teams like regressed from their usage of the run game last year. And I think, you know, you got to stick with what, what your personnel does best. Simeon says, do you really want a running QB with two neck injuries and a torn knee? Yeah, it's tough time to move on for everyone's sake. 
George says, my own understanding, I think the Giants have to act wisely in this draft. I believe they can trade up in this draft if they can use some of next year's draft picks with the one round pick this year. Interesting. Ralph says the offensive line was horrible last year. Yes, it was. Uh, well, the first half of the season, you know, especially, I think they got better when they brought Pew in and they uh, added some pieces and Thomas came back. But yeah, it was it was disgusting the first half of the season. Intel says, Pat, stop it, please. Daniel Jones is trash. Um, Intel says we have the worst quarterback in the NFC East. Ralph says Giants should take best left tackle. Uh, honestly, you know, I think we I think we did one of these chats one night. And somebody asked me like what I would do if I were the Giants GM. And it was like three weeks ago. And I said, honestly, if this were my team, I would just take another lineman. <laughs> um, like if I were, if I were drafting Madden, but here's the thing. If I were the Madden GM in franchise mode and I knew I had three more years as the GM, you know, maybe you take the offensive lineman, but do you have to show progress? Do you have a capable quarterback to win you more than, you know, five games on your roster like that, you know, somebody said it earlier, the giants are in a really tough spot. They're in a really tough spot of their own creation. Uh, George said the second round pick because next year's draft is weak. And I think Joe Shane got something up his sleeve, but, but will he act? We will see. Yeah. I think, and I, like I said, daily news, uh, I wrote in the daily news for Tuesday about the whole idea of should the Giants trade, is Joe, is Joe Shane going to look into all that? Blazin said, we don't have the worst quarterback in the NFC East. We have the sixth best quarterback in the NFC East. Ouch. John P says, too much noise around Giants homework on QB. With four-ish good QBs right there, this is just standard operating procedure. They should be doing homework on top 12 players. No, they're doing homework on, I mean, you know, they met with neighbors. They're doing homework on all the top receivers. They're doing homework on all these top guys. They're not just doing work on the quarterbacks, but uh, they're acting like a team that is heavy in the quarterback market and intending to try to get their guy. Uh, baseball says, Pat, how do we? How about we drive neighbors at six and trade back into the first round for Penix? Possible. Possible. Intel says, if the Giants draft a wide receiver, they will only win four games. You think they'll win more if they draft a quarterback? They're just not a good enough team. Chris says the fact that the entire staff, except Ryan Cowden, who was at UNC's Pro Day, went to Washington's Pro Day after leaving LSU's Pro Day, along with private workouts with JJ, May, and Penix loading, right? Pat, what do you want the Giants to do with the six picks, says Colin. Colin, I think um, – I would, I think quarterback to me, you don't just take a quarterback for quarterback's sake. You take your guy if he's there. I think based on how I've, how I've reported on how they've operated and what they're looking at, if the Giants guy is available after the third pick happens, assuming the top three aren't trading out, if the Giants quarterback is available after the top three picks happens, if I know Joe Shane, I think they go get their guy at four. That's what I think. You know, or five, right? Like I think now, uh, as we alluded to earlier, like it's possible what happens in the first three picks, you know, prevents the Giants from doing that. Um, I – don't look at this offensive line and say it's finished and it's a finished product. I think drafting a tackle, if there's a guy there who's worth that pick, Joe Alt, Notre Dame, right? Um, I think that is more than justifiable. But, Colin, I don't have a final pick right now on what to, what they're going to do. I think I think the the Giants are working out their preferences and also really trying to nail down what these other teams are doing because the other element of – should we trade up, right? Like the Giants, let's say they were trying to trade up to protect from the Vikings and what they're going to do chasing a quarterback. They would only want to trade. Let's say they know the top three are going quarterback, but they don't know which quarterbacks yet. If they think those top three are going quarterback and they feel confident in that, 
then they're still only going to trade to four if they know which quarterbacks are going one through three. And if their guy, if he's their fourth guy, right, if it's May or McCarthy or Daniels or whoever, if that guy's going to be available to go there. And that's another reason why Joe Shane's not just pulling the trigger on an early trade. They're all finishing their evaluations, but also he has to try to gauge and strategize, you know, who's going to be available at that pick. I'm not making that trade up, hoping my guy's there. I'm making that trade up if I know my guy's there. So, but Colin, I didn't really answer your question. I mean, I, you know, their offensive depth chart weapons wise, especially without Saquon screams taking a wide receiver, you know, Brock Bowers could help them as a tight end. Right. But you, you think wide receiver, like go number one, wide receiver, Marvin Harrison, Jr. Uh, Malik neighbors, you know, Adunze, um, I think based on how it look, looks like – based on how the board is falling, you would think that it looks like a possibility that it could go three QBs, Harrison, neighbors, right? And then the Giants would be in line to take either the fourth quarterback or a Dunze, right, or Joe Alt or Brock Bowers. Or if a Joe Alt goes with – one of the top wide receivers and three quarterbacks. You got the fourth quarterback at six. You have, um, you know, possibly two of those wide receivers available, right? So Joe Shane is right. Joe, Jim Harbaugh is right that even if you don't trade around here, you're going to get a good player at six. You are. So that's part of the reason why staying and taking one of those players at six is not a crazy idea. Because if it's out of your control where you can go and what you can do in that quarterback market, it could be that while you were hoping to go get that QB, you're just not able to. And therefore, picking that position player there is just your, your recourse. Obed says, I don't get why Jaden is not being talked about in giant circles. Um, I know I, I know the J.J. McCarthy Washington number two pick got, uh, you know, was, you know, coming out from NFL network, put that out there that people in the league thought that, but like, I'll be honest. I mean, I think, I, I think Jaden Daniels to two is what most people believe is going to happen. And um, it's also interesting. There's some people who think, and I know Phil Sims said this too, I think to me in our interview, but just that Daniels is excellent and that he views him as the clear QB two in this draft with Williams uh, there at number one. Um but just the idea that even though he can throw the football well, that, you know, maybe he doesn't have the arm strength to throw and succeed year round in the Northeast wind and that it would be a better idea to draft him into a position in a place where he's using that mobility and his running and also, you know, airing it out, but not necessarily playing in a place like MetLife Stadium or in Foxborough, right? Um, so that's something that some people have said, but you know, that's nitpicking a Heisman winning player as well. <laughs> can they trade up? I think, I think they'll try. We'll see if they can. Um, neighbors and McCarthy. Yeah. Chris, Chris answered that question on uh, Jade and we'll see neighbors and McCarthy are on the board at six. Do you think we pick JJ says Daniel. <sighs> as of this point, Daniel. Yes. I think they picked JJ, but um, like I told you, and I'm I, God's honest truth here, depending on who you're talking to right now, you hear different things. You know, like I remember coming out of the combine, there's a lot of people who just felt like JJ McCarthy was a good prospect, but he was more of like a late first, early second round pick and like wasn't even the player Penix was, um, even with the injury history of Penix, right? And I think as an evaluation that tracks with, you know, how I felt and how, you know, plenty of people I talked to felt. Um, so it's possible, as somebody said earlier, that McCarthy is an intriguing prospect to people, but that the idea that he's going to be drafted so high is, uh, is overblown. But I will say like teams have done enough on him and have shown enough interest in him that you know, it's hard to see JJ, you know, McCarthy not going into in that cluster of teams, right? Even if he doesn't end up being the top six pick that suddenly people are talking about him being. 
Um, you know, you got the Broncos there who worked in Pey- Sean Payton worked him out personally. Um, you got the Raiders, you know, those teams in the 11, 12, 13 area. So hard to see. All right, let's try to get through more here. Um, Obed says, I think May goes to Washington and Jaden falls. Hmm. Okay. Ralph says, who wins the NFC East this year? Are the Giants a last place team? I think they are the last place team in the NFC East this year, Ralph. I think um, the I think the Cowboys win the win the division this year again. I think it's Cowboys Eagles. Um, I think it's Cowboys Eagles. Um, Washington Giants. At this, that's how I feel at the moment. But the Eagles. The Eagles easily could be the bounce back team, but I still want to see them stop the bleeding, so to speak, on the field. Chris thinks uh, Daniels looks like a Kingsbury type quarterback. Um, Let's see. Yeah, Washington or New England, most teams would love to have the pick to grab Jaden. That's true. Joe says, I think the 2025 quarterbacks – are not expected of the same quality of this year's draft. That's part of the urgency to get one this year. You're correct. Super Unknown says, seems like you like Joe Milton. He seems inaccurate and lacks touch, jumps around too much in college, just saying. Rattler is a better prospect, in my opinion. Higher ceiling, higher QBIQ. Yes, but doesn't have the measurables, the arm, the height, size, um, You know, which for the Giants, like there's different teams value those things in different ways. The Giants place premium on those traits. Um, so that's part of the reason why he adds up for them. Also, he has performed well while they've spent time with him this off season. So I think that's meaningful. Um, and with him, you're talking about like a potential value play, right? That's a guy who you would get, um, at a later, at a later point. I see Joey B comedy in the house. I see you down there, Joey B. I'll get to you as soon as I can. Thanks for joining us, man. Big shout out there. Joey B huge supporter. All right, let's see. Who do we got? Um, Okay. Ralph says, do you think we can trade for Zach Wilson and see what Brian Dable can do with him? Oh, I I just shuddered. I just shuddered. (laughs) Uh, No, I do not think so. I think the Jets are going to have to cut him, and I do not think that's wise. Um, Let's see. Simeon says, play Michael Penix Jr. until the wheels fall off. Joe says, Aaron Wallman of the Giants strength and conditioning coach. He was the strength and conditioning coach for Indiana when Michael Penix Jr. was there. He would have insights into his injuries. Yep, all of that is part of their evaluation. I told my son that was an old-fashioned, my favorite, says Candyman. That's right. And Joe, back to the Wellman point. Um, Yeah, no, you get any insight you can into those medicals, into those processes, um, you know, so you would also have an insight maybe into the player's work ethic, uh, how he conducts himself around the building. So all of that would be very valuable as well. Super unknown says, don't sleep on Drew Locke. Ralph says, drafting a quarterback is a big chance to bust. I'd rather have a blue chip offensive lineman. Ah, uh, that's fair. That's fair. Vinny Vegas says, did the GM get another two years at least? I think that the, the, View around the NFL is that Dable's on a shorter list and clock than Joe Shane. Also, John Maris said that he doesn't view Brian Dable and Joe Shane as a package deal. So that's really meaningful, obviously, coming from the the team owner to say that. Um, So more than likely, Shane has a minimum of two years from now, um, unless this coming year went, you know, extremely bad. D. Kitt says Isaiah Adams, Christian Haynes, Zach Zinter, Cooper Beebe. There are a lot of options at guard, Dominic Puny too. Isaiah Adams is the one who I identified and reported that at the Senior Bowl, the Giants met with him two separate times. Um, also, we're watching him closely on the field while I was there, and um, you know, showed a lot of in- they showed a lot of interest in him, and he played well. So, um, from at Illinois, he's someone to keep an eye on. George says Joe Shane is like a calm before the storm. He's not afraid to act. So buckle up. I believe it's going to be a lot of trades in this draft. I do think he's going to take action or at least try. 
Ralph says, Pat, what is your perfect draft for the 2024 Giants? Um, Ralph, I think the perfect draft is don't trade next year's one. Um, get a quarterback who you can A, develop, and also could be capable to step in and help you at some point this year if need be. Um, upgrade the offensive line more than you already have, if you have. Um, add an offensive weapon at a corner, add a um, probably a running back, and uh, continue to beef up the interior defensive line. You know, those are those are the elements I would say. D Kit says, Pat, if they allow themselves to be jumped and they don't get a QB, they both should be gone. Hmm. Interesting. D kid says, Pat, I, Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I give you a hard time sometimes, but the truth is you're probably the only guy left who questions things. I appreciate it. Yep. D kid. Thanks again for all the support, man. JJ says, Pat, you still believe in my Kafka or would you rather Dayball be calling plays? Um, honestly, you know, Dayball's going to be calling the plays. That's how I view it. Um, that's how it's tracking. Um, I was honestly surprised he didn't just announce right then and there at the, at the coaches meetings uh, or at the owners meetings that he is um, I think you should expect him to call the plays. Um, you know, I think it's not about Kafka. It's about Dable. It's about believing in the head of the operation. Can he manage a game? Can, what, where does he provide the most value? I think for Brian Dable's purposes, you know, he hasn't managed games well. What he came here with was was uh, you know coming off of one of the better offenses in the league and one of the more encouraging quarterback developmental processes in the league with Josh Allen. So can he replicate that here in New York? Right, um, you know maybe calling plays is a way for him to finally prove uh, that last year was the anomaly and not the first season. Um, you know I think it'll be interesting though because it's not going to be any easier for Brian Dable to manage the whole game while also calling the offensive plays. Right. So that'll be interesting. How does that process work? Cause from Joe Shane and John Mara and Steve Tish and their standpoint, you want your head coach to be in total control and he's had trouble controlling himself on the sidelines, making appropriate decisions in key pressure moments in games, uh, weighing the right things and coming to the right and sound conclusions. So um, really a tricky situation. I will say I don't view Kafka's offensive play calling as the reason why their offensive struggle. I mean, you know, has he, have there been play calls that Kafka wanted back or, you know, could have gone better? Yeah, sure. But I think the roster construction, the offensive scheme, uh, the game plans, the game management, the play calling, it all falls into the bucket of managing those game situations. You know, I do not, rested on Mike Kafka's head. Um, Super Unknown says Michael Penix, no, not at six. Um, Intel says Michael Penix Jr. is better than Daniel Jones. Tony says, to be honest, I believe if we want Michael Penix, we need to get him at 13 because someone is going to get him if we don't. 13. Um, oh, you're a Raiders fan. Oh, look at Tony. We got a Raiders fan in the house. Let's go. Yeah. So you think, okay, so you would take him at 13. Interesting. Thank you, Tony. Checking in from Raiders land. Appreciate that. D kid says, we don't know how the giants have these QBs rated other than Caleb. Yep. Other than Caleb, good qualification. Uh, but what we have brought to you D kit is the fact that they've been especially in on, on the QBs and, that McCarthy is a huge part of that mix. Like that's, that's the, that's the thing that has jumped out during this process is how much time they spent on JJ. Right. Joe says, Pat, I wouldn't take the risk on panics at six after dealing with Jones and his injuries. The risk is too high, but yeah. So then why would you take a risk on him in the top 15, but not at six? I mean, I know 15 and six are different value picks, but you know, if a guy's a first round quarterback, he's a first round quarterback, right? But no, I appreciate your honesty there. Um, Simeon says, scared money don't make none. Ray says, so Daniel Jones can't return to 2022 level play with a new O line. Was 2022 level play good enough? 
a couple big games down the stretch, but I mean, that was a defense led season. If that's the ceiling, I guess is what I'm saying, you know, again, proof that they need a quarterback, a new quarterback in the building. Chris says if Williams, May, Daniels, McCarthy, and Harrison Jr. Are off the board and looking at positional value, you take the quarterback over the wide receiver. If Dable, Kafka, and Shane believe they can make it work with Michael Penix Jr., take him. All right. Ray says Drake, Bay, Drake May is better than Daniel. No sure thing. Super Unknown says agree with D Kit. Love you, Pat. Thanks, Super Unknown. Appreciate you. Ray says I've been a fan since 1967. I'm used to losing. Oh, poor Ray. Damn. Ray, since 67. Thanks for checking in. D Kit says, Ray, at this point, they cannot take the risk on Jones from a health perspective. Ray says, I get it. D Kit says, Dell and Collins were both third rounders, right? And Jalen, ha- Jalen Hyatt was a third rounder. And Wandale Robinson was a second rounder. So, you know, the, the, the thing about the Giants, the quiet part to say out loud about the Giants is that a lot of their process makes sense. They haven't drafted well enough. They haven't signed free, the right free agents. They haven't made the right player decisions, right? Plenty of their process makes sense. But are they making the right decisions on the players? That matters. Fair point, D-Kit. Ray says, after 2022, I feel vindicated on Daniel. The Crunch Bunch says, I think the Giants still have the best package for a trade-up because of their sixth pick, but the Vikings aren't adding an extra first if they're not 100% sure they can get ahead of New York. Thoughts? Um, Yeah, especially with the Giants having the sixth pick in the sense that not only is it worth more, but also, you know, teams trading back in this draft where it's not like there's an, an unlimited amount of players that teams view as worth a top 10 or worth a high first rounder, right? Or a mid first round or top 15 pick. Teams don't want to trade too far out of clusters of players, right? Like the Giants did, you know, going back to Kadarius Tony that year. So the Giants are in prime position. You're right. Having the sixth pick if teams want to make a trade and get value, but not move too far back out of their preferred cluster of players. Um, Let's see. Okay. Who is a bigger disappointment? Ray says. Darren Waller or Kenny Galladay? Woo. Uh, I mean, I would say you put them in the same bucket of. Um, I would I would say you put them in the same bucket of guys who they expended significant assets in to help an offense and fix an offense who did not serve that purpose really in any way. Um, the Galladay contract was a, was a monster contract for a player. They also extended Waller though, a guy who is now considering it retirement. So I don't know. Ty goes to the runner, Ray. D kid says the Eric gray pick currently looks like a day three complete miss. No doubt about it. H5000 says neighbors ran a 435. Um, I'll add 0.03 back to make it 438 to try to make it a true combine score. Adunze ran a 445 at combine. I want separation, clean routes, sticky hands. In my opinion, that's neighbors. Yeah, but Adunze always gets open, right? I mean, I'm not saying I would take Adunze over neighbors, but, you know, that's fair what you said too. But, um, you know, Adunze has the production there for sure. It gets open. Chronicle says breaking news, Carson Wentz to the Chiefs. Uh, I think you're playing an April Fool's joke on me right now, Chronicles, but uh, you let me know. George says, I think the wide receiver from the 49ers is a trade target. Ayuk, I think you're talking about, right? Because the 49ers and Brandon are far apart in talks. Maybe the 49ers trade him during the draft. What do you think? Yeah, Ayuk is a guy who could be on the move. Stefan Diggs is a name that keeps floating around from the Bills. Um, not sure the Giants are in the market for like veteran uh, wide receivers who they have to pay a ton of money. Um, but especially a guy like Diggs has created some issues off the field. 
But that's, I wouldn't rule that out, George. I mean, listen, when you have the kind of need that the Giants have, you know, like what they did at pass rusher with Brian Burns, when you have these kind of needs, like you kick the tires. I know they, they reached out and inquired about Mike Evans, for example, before he resigned back in Tampa, at wide receiver. That's a big name at that position. Um, I do think the Giants are running out of some premium assets to make trades for guys like that of that caliber, though. But we'll see. Um, I would think it's more likely with the wide receiver draft class being as strong as it is with cost control, they draft one. Joey B, what's going on? D. Kitt says, I think the Chargers are more of a problem than the Cardinals because it is expected Harbaugh wants more draft capital. Plus, he has opportunity to direct J.J. to a team, as weird as that sounds. Yeah, that's going to be a fascinating dynamic there. Harbaugh, how much is he propping up him to help the Chargers stock? Anthony says, okay, Pat, tell us, who's their guy? Who do you think they like at quarterback from this draft? Based on availability, the spot in the draft, how they've spent their time, right? I mean, if it, at six, could could it be McCarthy? Could it be May at, you know, late first, early second, Michael Penix Jr.? Um, you know, the Jaden Daniels and Caleb Williams, they feel like they're not going to be available there, um, you know. But I can't tell you for sure right now, Anthony. I'm still working on that. But like I said, the 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 JJ McCarthy stuff and the amount of time they spent on him really is the eye opening part of this process so far. We're going on two hours here, by the way. We'll wrap it up soon, but I want to get to all your questions. George says I think a lot of trades are going to happen in the draft. Could be an active could be an active draft. Joey says, do you see us trading up? Do you see any possibility we get Marvin Harrison Jr. What are they doing at safety? Is Justin Simmons viable? I mean, Justin Simmons, I think the Eagles were interested in initially, but, you know, the price range was uh, was not what they wanted to spend. So hard for me to imagine that the Giants with their cap space, they're going there on a Justin Simmons. And frankly, Simmons is a good enough player where he should get paid or paid a significant amount by somebody. And also I would think would join a team that can win. Um, so I don't think – yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know, especially because Joe Shane doesn't value the safety position as far as like paying it over other premium positions on the roster as he's proven that guys go. So that doesn't make I don't that wouldn't add up to me. And Simmons is too good of a player to be like taking a, a bargain deal or something like that. Yes, I think it's possible the Giants trade up. They need that partner to do it. They need the dance partner to the tango. Marvin Harrison Jr., you know. He's the kind of guy, like, remember when Trevor Lawrence went one overall? Just one of those where, like, sometimes guys just go wire to wire as the top guy as the at their position or in, their, in the draft. And even if the hype dies down or just keeps, keeps steady or it gets boring to talk about his name at the top because it's been said for so long, like, there's a reason he was listed at the top of that position group, and that's how it was the whole time. There's a huge part of me that thinks that's the way it's going to be with Marvin Harrison Jr. You know, like if Arizona picks it for, he'll be the fourth pick. Or if New England, for some reason, doesn't go quarterback at three, he's the pick or, you know, whatever it is. Um, you know, those kind of things, I think, uh, you know, that's where that shakes out is that he won't end up at six because he'll end up being taken where, People tracked him to be drafted the whole time. Joey, I think wide receiver or QB at six, I think it's going to be tough. Um, I think it's going to be tough to – it's tough to predict QB over receiver given how many teams above them need a quarterback on the board and look like they might take one. Uh, but I do think if the right quarterback is there, it's QB, if that makes sense. Joey B says, can I just come chill with you for the draft at MetLife? I'll tweet your tweets and be an assistant for the day. <laughs> I think what you're suggesting, Joey B, is that we have a draft party is what you're suggesting. You know what? Down the road, maybe that's how we'll handle this. Obviously, I want to be there available in the facility to kind of handle that at the Giants building and cover it close to the scene there. Uh, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe one day not too long in the future, that will be a better uh, way to spend our resources and our time and energy, right? Anthony says, hey, Pat, where can we purchase talking ball hats? 
And Chronicles also says, Pat, a couple of recommendations for you. Would you think of a call-in Q&A show and Talking Ball merch would be fire? Could that be in the works? Talking Ball merch is in the works. Um, I will tell you when it's here. Um, but I've had enough requests from people on here now. And to be honest with you, I feel like rocking it around town too. So um, Talking Ball merch is in the works. Yes, it is. And I will keep you updated on where that can be purchased. Noel says, Pat, any th- or Noel, any, I think it's Noel. Pat, any thoughts to the Giants trading Slayton for a fourth or a fifth and using it in a package to move up if they take a receiver in the first round? Haven't heard anything like that, but I like your creativity. Um, he is the model of consistency on this roster at the receiver position, though. And they have two young guys who still haven't like fully proven themselves. So you do need some guys that you know like can play in an NFL game and produce for you. Um, let's see. What we got? Joey B says, Pat, is your wife mad at you? She's in there banging those dishes. <laughs> Joe, you're hilarious, man. Well, if you're asking me, is a two-hour live chat from 9 to 11 p.m. in Eastern time not always well-received by the missus? <laughs> The answer is yes, but uh, no, no, we support each other here. Um, You know, she's interested in the Giants and in the NFL, just like you guys are. Uh, We share that passion for football and sports, actually. Um, So she understands. And, you know, sometimes if I'm working from home, um, she tries to beat me to some of those. uh, Like if I'm not the one breaking the news on something, she'll share with me. She's got her NFL alerts on and she'll share that stuff with me, you know. Uh, and try to get it to me first to break the news to me. So that's a fun game we play. Baseball says it'd be funny if we start beating the Eagles now after Saquon goes there. Ooh, I'm telling you, that rivalry is going to be awesome. Awesome. Super Unknown says, Pat, uh, you're inhaling money tonight, getting too famous even. Don't rope us old timers out. No way, no way. I do appreciate, though, um, I do appreciate all the super stickers and the super chat and um, all of you guys who have contributed, whether it's 10 bucks, five bucks, two bucks. Like I said, if you didn't contribute anything but a question or if you didn't ask a question and you're just liking this and hitting that thumbs up right now while we're live, um, I really appreciate it. All I ask is that you subscribe and you come back next time. Um, And like I said, When I have breaking news on these, I will bring it. And you guys will be the first to know before we push it. Wow, you really weren't kidding about Carson Wentz. Because now I'm looking, I see D. Kitt uh, said that Wentz signed with the Chiefs too. And the Chiefs, the Chiefs and Carson Wentz. All right, so so you're telling me the Chiefs dynasty is over? No, I'm just kidding. Hmm, interesting. Well, If Andy Reid revitalizes and resuscitates Carson Wentz's career, I mean, all bets are off. (laughs) All right. Um, Let's see. Joe says, and also, by the way, super unknown, like I do this for the, the enjoyment of talking to you guys and bringing information and entertaining you guys. So, you know, like right now, I think we're, we got a hundred, 150, People 200 coming in and out on some of these. I remember around free start of free agency, it was like 300, 400 on this. Um, but once we get this rolling, we're going to have shows where we have thousands of people on here. Um, I will conduct myself the same way. And I remember the day oneers, the people who are most loyal, you guys who stick by me, the Giants fans. And um, really, I, you know, if we get, if we get big enough in here where I have a, you know, producer, you know, looking at the questions, making sure we're getting to all the Giants diehards and not overlooking anybody. Like, that's what we're going to do, you know. Joe says, is there a chance Daniel Jones doesn't pass his physical? Then what happens to his contract? Uh, I mean, if he doesn't pass his physical, I mean, he's he's on the hook for 
for his, full, you know, the full guarantees this season. So he's guaranteed the money this year, Joe, whether he passes his physical for the start of spring or not, um, or, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, the Giants are locked into that guaranteed money this season. So not until next year do you get a new situation of talking about getting out of money. Brett says, hey, Pat, we don't need no stinking quarterback. Number eight on your shelf is pissed and ready to prove he is the man. Danny Dimes, that's him. Chronicle says, Pat, will um, I will be at the Sexy Dexy charity softball game with LPG and Brandon Jacobs. The event looks fire. I agree. Uh, I intend to be there as well. Obviously, sometimes, you know, family stuff or whatever comes up and I can't come to something on the weekend. But my plan right now is to attend that event. LPG is a great guy. Um, um, he does a great job with that stuff, brings people together, brings fans together. And, uh, I like Dex a lot too. So hopefully looking forward to supporting that. Um, maybe even, I can't promise this, but may even have, uh, Dex on the podcast to, to lead into that event. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, let's see. Yep. Went signed. Not a joke. <laughs> Let's see. Commanders are going to take McCarthy at two. Mark my words, says Joey B, and mess up the whole draft board. I don't think so. I will say I don't think so. D Kit says this was a good time. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, D Kit. George says good night. You should do the two nights of the draft. Appreciate you. Uh, Michael Penix Jr. was born to wear blue, says Chris. Joey B says who started the talking ball merch idea though? I want five percent. <laughs> No, Joey B. I think I think you might have been the one who was on it for the first time. I think you were. Um, trust me, the day oneers are getting that merch. Uh, Joey B says Chronicles. I'll be there. Let's meet up. Uh, Joey B does have an IG. Joey B's IG. Hold on, I got you right here. Joey, drop your Instagram in there. It's. Um, Hold on. I had it right here. Where is it? I'll get that to you in a second, Chronicles. Bill says, not feeling well, been in lurk mode. Thanks for the show. Oh, Bill, thanks for the two bucks, man. Appreciate that super sticker. Yeah, no worries, man. This is, uh, I would say for the better part of March, I've been like in and out of under the weather. Um this happens to me a lot where I feel like I get through a lot of the off season in the winter and I'm like, I made it. I didn't get sick. And then the seasons start changing and I get slammed <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, ah, oh, damn, right when I thought, you know, knock on wood. Um, so I hear you on that. Let's see what else. Chronicle says I'm a day one. That's right. Joe says, first time chatting with you, Pat. Just subscribed, and I'll pass the word along to other Giants fans on other media platforms. Thanks for providing your time to this chat. Joe, really appreciate you, man. You you really brought it today, um, and you really added a lot to this chat. You were a huge part of this conversation in your first time jumping on, um, and I can't thank you enough. So I really appreciate that. Joey B has a few Instagrams. Oh, he's keeping it. Oh, there they are. Yeah. Joe Face Becker. That's right. That I think that's the one of Joey B Comedy, uh, Bleed in Blue 82. They had three IGs. Look at this guy. He's got all his cell phones. He's working them. All right. Uh, Chronicles says, appreciate this, Pat. Let your family know. We thank you for taking time away from them to do these. They've been a great way to keep uh, us informative, always informative and a great time. Maybe a live after draft late. Yeah, I got to think of what to do on the draft weekend and the draft nights because you guys clearly have an appetite for like some live content on the draft nights. Chris says, if you could decide to come down to the Giants at Commanders game this year, let's get together with Authentic and do a live show from the place formerly known as FedEx Field. Yeah, yeah. Hey, man, I would, uh, I would, I would welcome that. I would welcome that. Uh, that would be cool. Joey B says, uh, yeah, he's got a few. Oh, Chronicles always already follows him. I didn't know it was the same Joe. <laughs> yep, that's the same Joe Face Becker. Um, guys, this has been awesome. This probably is our longest live chat ever. I think we've gone two hours and 15 minutes it's going to be. Remember, we are sponsored by Bet Online. 
Also buy a State 98 coffee. It's an Essencia de Cafe from El Salvador. It dates back to 1798. You can make an iced coffee in three seconds. I do it all the time when I'm doing talking ball. Um, I was drinking old fashioned tonight, however, because it was called for. Um, but thank you so much always for being a part of these. Uh, remember, we break news on here. We bring you insight. We bring you the latest information and analysis. We take questions. We help you. Um, uh, we allow you even to drive the conversation. You guys have been great at, um, you know, from Candyman's first comment about what a potential trade could look like and what players you can include all the way here uh, to the end with you guys asking about merch and other ways to support the channel. Um, huge support from everybody. D kit leading, I think with a $10 super sticker, but everybody who contributed and, um, and added more information and insight to this. I really can't thank you enough. We will be back here live. Um, the plan is on Thursday, 9 p.m. Eastern. So that's Thursday, Mar um, April 4th. We will be back here. Uh, got some more pods in the works. Um, really excited about more guests coming on to the podcast, the Talking Ball with Pat Leonard podcast. Remember to check out my column on the New York Daily News website about Joe Shane and the trade market and and the Giants quarterback hunt at the top of the draft. Yes, Chronicles, see you on Thursday. You're welcome. And Joey B says, April 26th, back at Reds in Carlstadt, Pat. Come be my guest. April 26th, that's a draft night, Joey B. How late are you going to be? Keep us in, updated on that. And again, thank you so much for taking the time. If you missed this live chat, you can re-watch it on the YouTube channel, Pat, at PL on NFL. Or you can listen to it on Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your podcast, the Talking Ball with Pat Leonard Podcast. Thank you so much, everybody. See you next time on Talking Ball Live.